Right. I, I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening carefully. You, you make an allusion to the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, yep. where people actually got up and said, you know, I killed your brother. Yep. I raped your mother. You're saying that instead of having a balloon fest and remembering the great struggle and naming our heroes, to celebrate our 50 years of independence, Kenyans should actually go back and say, we've uh, dis uh, taken so much money out of our central bank, we've killed so many politicians and we must stop. Yes. So no celebration, self-reflection, we're doing the sort of Maoist thing of look into your you know, self-criticism, purge yourself of your bourgeois aspirations. Is that, is that the way forward? So I, I'm not sure that you should have no celebration whatsoever, right? right but but I, I think, I, I mean, yes. I think uh, basically taking account of is where the country thing. is right. and basically saying, let's try tomorrow to be different right. because you have to have a but break yes, point. But yes, but it, uh, I'm following your drift again in yeah. this instance. Somebody, somewhere, some politician, some should say ha ha has to say, I have done wrong. Absolutely. And, 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 from and your, by the way, from you your shouldn't have a problem. With politicians, you're saying <laughs> this is going to be the first <laughs> impulse. Surely not. Surely not. No, it's not going to be their impulse, but I think it's going to be incredibly useful. And by the way, it doesn't look like you're going to have a shortage of politicians who could, in principle, say what they've done wrong if they were willing to do it. Well, I wouldn't comment upon <laughs> that because that's another conversation. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I mean, we're not, a, we're talking about social change. That's right. Because in essence, you're saying you've got all these corrupt politicians, they should be the first. What's likely to happen then in society is the next minute you'll be deported on for treasonable act and you'll never come to Africa again. So I, I, I'm so just that's, saying... So that's the second part of, of forgiveness. Yes, exactly. So uh, elaborate then. So, so think about what happens in a Catholic confession, right? You say what you've done and you basically are forgiven by past sin with the understanding that you can open a new page. Look, if somebody has been corrupt for 20 years, why should they just continue? Why shouldn't they just continue? Why stop now? Now, I actually think that people want to be honest. But if you're working in a system where everybody is corrupt, you have no incentive to be different. Think about something very different for a second, like sports. Do you remember this, the story with Lance Armstrong and doping? Right. Now, I've talked to many cyclists who've been doping. Everybody has been doping. He is not the only one. And everybody just treated it as part of cycling. Yes. Now, here is the situation. If nobody dopes, there's a particular order of how good people are. And if everybody dopes, the order remains the same, but everybody's in worse health. Right. So I'm taking, you're saying, you know, Lance Armstrong has played the role of a toner because yes. of him, because of being stripped of all his medals. He's taken the racetrack back and everybody who's done it thereafter, Bradley Wiggins, Chris Froome, these guys, if you tested them now, wouldn't be drug. I, I, think, I think we should have done more than just uh, blame him. I think one of the mistakes was we took Lance Armstrong, we put him on the stage, we pointed the so finger. The, the idea of a martyrdom. Yes. I think, know, I there, think there's, that there's a martyrdom. We're going to, we, a, a Jesus Christ figure is <laughs> going to return to modern day world, die for all our sins, and then Kenya will be a happy country. No, I think, I think we need everybody to admit. So if you think about the cycling, I think we shouldn't have just said it's Lance Armstrong. I think he should have led and then we should have taken all the rest of the cyclists right. and they should all have said, okay, tomorrow is going to be a different day and we're pledging, we're swearing in the Bible, we're promising, we're taking an oath to be different. Which is interesting, again, because of this idea in society of respectability, mm -hmm. of tolerance, of acceptance. I could admit to something frightfully awful and you'd have held me in very high esteem. Lance Armstrong r led the sort of yellow band movement curing kids with cancer, huge sums of money. Yeah. So because his reputation has been taken to the cleaners, he's no longer an effective member of society, although he's played a role in, why should I be the sacrificial lamb? I want you to respect me. <coughs> I want you to respect my reputation. So and I'm not going to tell you when I lied or when I killed someone. Yeah. Too much like hard work. So, so I think it's not going to be easy to uh, get politicians to do it. But in the same way that it's not easy to get people to go to confession and say all kinds of terrible things. So, you know, uh, we, could, we could try it out. I mean, one way we could try it is we could try to do it in, in private. We can try and pass some straight laws. I, f how about the following idea? How about if you say, look, for the 50th anniversary, we're going to create incredibly harsh rules about corruption moving forward. But what we're going to do is we're going to give people a clean slate if they admit to things that they've done in the past. 
So this is it. This is your chance to come on board, say what you've done. Now, if you'll keep on being corrupt, there'll be terrible penalties and they my, will also cover all the my, way to your my, day of my, your birth. My family won't allow it <laughs> because I'm saying, I'm still saying, maybe this is the cultural difference, where this is a cultural difference. I'm going to give you an image that I saw a, a, a reading about the Japanese because you've given all these anecdotal things. Something that shocked me when the Japanese were sort of fleeing from this nuclear power plant that had burst. Yeah. Apparently, they were heading out of the city, but everybody did so in single file and That's in right. order, without thinking to overtake their neighbor and be at the front of the queue. That's right. I'm trying to suggest that that had everything to do with spirituality. And the fact that you've negated the idea of some kind of spiritual clock, not a social clock that's making us do what we do, maybe because they're Shintoist, why do they all stick in a line? I tell you one thing in Kenya, yeah. if we were all legging it out of Nairobi, it would not be in orderly fashion. So, so, this so is we're a, different. So this is and a good your example. studies, as I said before, have got nothing to do with us. So, so let, me, let me disagree with you. So when you look at the Japanese, for example, it was incredible how they stood in line. It was also incredible how much the Japanese saved for retirement. And you look at all of this and you could say the Japanese have tremendous self-control. They just have this tremendous ability to hold it. But have you ever been to a bar in Japan? Have you? No, I've never been to Japan. Okay, stop. if you go to Japan and you go to a bar, so these people saying, yeah, like they have no self-control whatsoever. So we're drawing, yeah, we're drawing to a, a close and we must bring okay. it to a close. So the thing that is interesting is that we do have superficial differences in behavior, but there are no deep differences. So we all have struggle with self-control right, now so, versus so, so, later. So extend the image with the Japanese as your, as your, as your model. So when we test the Japanese in terms of self-control, they have the same basic problem with self-control now versus later. But there are some cases like standing in line where society comes in and creates tremendous social rules, but the rules only apply to that. Or the rules only apply to illegal downloads. Or the rules only apply to monogamy or infidelity or something like that. Deep down inside, we're all the same. We're all incredibly similar when you look at the psychology of human behavior and decision making. Society comes later and say, in this particular domain, here is how we behave. And basically takes the ability to make decisions out of us. It just says, this is what we do. If you're in Japan, 30% of your salary, you just save. You don't even ask, you don't even think about it. But the same thing is the question of what are these rules? What are these unspoken rules that we as society agree to? And I think that they are different in different places. But maybe the 50th year anniversary is a good time to rewrite some of them, have new agreements and therefore have a better outcome. Dan Ariely, social scientist. Thank you so very much for coming on the JSO interview. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.